Good morning. As many of you know, our CLS community lost one of our dear ones last week and we are grieving. Carol Ansel was a bright light to everyone who had the privilege of knowing her. I would say she was a walking fruits of the spirit and she was blessed with a funny, outgoing, and sometimes mischievous personality. We are going to truly miss her. We know without a doubt where our friend Carol is at this very moment in the arms of Jesus. And oh, what she is experiencing right now. But I ask that you would join me in prayer for her husband, Kirby, for her two sons, Kyle and Clark, and her daughter-in-law, Brooke. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for the guidance your scripture gives. We believe in the power of your word, that it can make a difference, that your promises of life eternal keep us focused on your truth. Oh, Father, we need this scripture today more than ever, and I ask that your words would give assurance and comfort to Carol's family and her wide body of friends as they miss her. Be ever so near, Lord Jesus. We pray this in the power and strength of our Savior, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, the lesson this week is honestly timely. Paul speaks to the Thessalonians about their departed loved ones. His words are words of certainty. Verse 14 says, Jesus died and rose again. Paul continues with his letter to this new church wanting to clarify some of the issues that they were confused about. These verses in chapter four have a large focus on three things that maybe your mom uh, asked you to not bring up in polite conversation, sex, money, and debt. And as we see here, these are all rolled into one important chapter. Well, obviously, these are some heavy topics to cover in just 20 minutes. And because of that, I want to recommend um, a companion uh, to go along with today's lesson. Uh, Russ Levinson has been speaking on Wednesday evenings um, in a teaching called Growing in Grace. It's unbelievably good and very applicable to what we are studying this week, especially the second and third weeks of Growing in Grace. So if you haven't had the opportunity uh, to listen to the Wednesday night series, you can access Growing in Grace on the St. Martin's website, and I highly recommend that you do. Well, this week we're now in the second part of Paul's letter. And in these verses, we see his passionate shepherd's heart. Remember, Paul left this new church uh, very quickly, and he left them in an opposition, uh, in an atmosphere of opposition to this growing Jesus movement. He knew that the way to encourage their faith was to prepare them for the future, ultimately preparing them for the time that Jesus would return. This part of Paul's letter is focused on making right choices now, because we know that ultimately those choices will affect what happens in the future. Same goes for us today. We live in a multi-choice culture. Certain decisions can change the direction of our life. Paul wanted these Thessalonians to make sure their decisions lined up with God's will and his word. Were their lives in harmony with their new Christian beliefs? One of the commentaries pointed out, if you base your decisions on current popular opinion, you'll always be on shaky ground because current culture changes every single day. I mean, what's in today is out tomorrow. But if your decisions are based on God, God's word, you will have a firm foundation because God's truth is solid. It doesn't change ever. 
In addressing these new believers, Paul wanted their outward behavior to match their inner beliefs. The word holiness is used three times in this one chapter. And we've talked about this before. Every time uh, you see a word on repeat, especially so close together in one chapter, it's kind of a red flag for you to pause and pay attention because the author is telling you this is very important. This word holiness, it can sometimes make us feel uneasy, uncomfortable. In our modern world, it can sometimes have a connotation um, that is negative. A lot of people think of holiness as synonymous with perfection, too lofty, unattainable, in that only God is holy, only God is perfect. When I did a little research on how this word is used in these verses, I discovered it can have a broader meaning. N.T. Wright says the Hebrew word for holiness is a word that highlights the realm of the sacred in contrast to everything that is common or, and profane. The adjective of this Hebrew word refers to God, and this is the part that I love, what belongs to him. It has the definition of one set apart for God's purpose, different from what is routine or commonplace. So while we might not say, oh yes, I'm holy, we would consider ourselves set apart for God's purpose or set apart from the current culture. Are we perfect? <laughs> no, capital N-O. But are we doing our best with the help of the Holy Spirit to be in one mind with God and his word? That's practicing holiness. Sanctification, uh, which we talked about in our lesson, is the long, slow, uh, I would say lifelong process of dying to self so that God's image can be reflected through us. Oswald Chambers said that this sanctification is a stripping away of self so that we are one with Jesus. This also is a day-to-day -day discipline. But, you know, it's not really a question of whether God is willing to sanctify me. The real question is, am I willing? You know, there's no such thing as proud holiness. It's not something you can force or do in your own energy. It's the atonement, which is the reconciliation of God to mankind through Christ who is working through you. This grows through obedience, service, and prayer. This, faith, this faithfulness, it has the ability to be contagious. We see somebody, we watch how somebody handles a situation outwardly, and you're curious what's going on inside. That was Paul's hope for this new body of believers. He wanted others to see their changed lives and have others wonder, wow, why are these people different? What's going on inside? And then for the observers to want what the believers had. Paul addresses the sexual immorality that was prevalent at the time Greek culture was beyond decadent. Pagan religions could even include temple cult prostitution. Some temples doubled as brothels. These young Thessalonians faced temptation all around them, everywhere they went. To stray sexually outside of marriage, uh, it wasn't even thought of as outside the norm. This culture and its people had fallen so far away from God's original plan. Paul wanted the new converts to be set apart, to be different, to be holy. He knew this was important if the church was going to grow and if the church was going to survive. 
You can imagine the pressure for these young Christians to stay significantly different, to live a different lifestyle than what was all around them. Uh, you can imagine because you can look around in our society today. It's really not that much different and we all can relate. Paul uses the word holiness to describe when humans reflect what it means to be in God's image. And he draws on the circle of ideas that belonged with the temple in Jerusalem. If you remember the Old Testament documents, what was needed if anyone was to go to the temple to be close to God, to be in the presence of God. Holiness was absolutely mandatory. It was vital that you came before the living God in a complete state of purity. There were washing rituals, there were animal sacrifices. We know, of course, Jesus' death changed all of this and has purified his people from all their sins. Now God's spirit dwells within us as individuals and as a body of believers. And because of that, we become the new temple for God to live in. That's why it absolutely does matter what we do with our bodies. First Corinthians 3, 16 tells us, don't you know that you're, you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within your midst. For these Thessalonians, this new way of life, it was a challenge. And we are studying God's words, but these are God's commands. These guidelines were laid out by Jesus. Paul continues with his teaching on faith-based choices. Verse 9 says, just love one another. This also is a command that we love God and we love our neighbor. Do we ever need this in 2020? I would say, especially this month. Well, Robin Wade discussed in one of our Tuesday discussions um, that she keeps thinking about the song, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. I agree with that. And I wanna give you uh, a little step in the spirit for this week. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different and I know it might sound a little bit crazy, but I want you to hum that song. We all know it, what the world needs now, love, sweet love. I want you to hum that song kind of in your brain when you're looking at others. Um, Again, that sounds crazy, but I want you to think about what the world needs now is love and not judgment. At the grocery store, uh, when you're driving, when you're watching the news, ask God to overflow his love in your life for others. See if this changes your outlook. See if if you feel more connected to humanity, see if you have more grace for your fellow man. I want you to just kind of practice this this week and then discuss it in your groups next week. Paul also tells his readers, uh, and I'm quoting Susan Finnegan here, keep your mouth shut, mind your own business, and work hard. Uh, this has been good advice for over 2000 years, and it never goes out of style. Well, in the final verses of chapter four, Paul wanted to speak to the new Christians concern about life after death. Many of these new believers felt that Jesus's return would be imminent, meaning in their lifetime, and that Jesus would only come for those who were living and not for those believers that had already died. I need to say, this is one of those passages that um, because it involves the rapture is debated over and over again by scholars and theologians that have not only one doctorate degree, but many that hang on their walls. Um, but I wanna give you a verse that really helped me 
uh, move through this passage. And the verse is 2 Corinthians 5, 8. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the promise of life with Christ after we die because his death has already paid for the sin that separates us from God. But after we leave this earth and we are present with Christ, our earth bodies will lie silent, sleeping in their graves until that great trumpet sounds and Christ returns. Well, I also want to share with you what Sally Mitchell wrote me in an email. She said, the best part of the end of chapter four is that regardless of our timing, our immaterial selves will be re not reunited with our resurrected new physical bodies, and we will be with Jesus forever. This occurrence is as real and certain as my typing this text. I love that. It will be something to see. It, this will be an astounding amen moment like we've never seen before. Well, so a few thoughts as we end this lesson. From these verses, you can see how Paul wanted this new Thessalonian church to live their walk. I've always thought of these standards that Paul laid out here, such as faithfulness in marriage, working hard, that love was the greatest of values. I thought that these were central core values across all, all cultures, but actually they began in the Christian movement. And I've been slowly, slowly, I mean, what's another word for slower than slowly? I've been making my way through this book, Dominion by Tom Holland. And as you can see, this is not really a light little beach read. It's a serious history of the Christian revolution and its influence on the world. And what I found fascinating is that these instructions that Paul outlines in this letter were specific and unique to Christianity. They didn't develop in the Eastern cultures. In fact, the Greeks and the Romans, um, they found them laughable. For example, the principle that every human life is to be of equal value, that was thought of as unimaginable when they first heard it. Uh, but Holland's point is that many of these central values in our Western and even uh, secular culture, their roots began in Christianity and in the Christian faith. And we pretty much take that for granted. So what Paul spells out here for these Thessalonian believers, it not only changed their culture, but it changed much of the world, which is exactly what Paul's goal was, that as many people worldwide would come to know the one true God who created all beings in him, his image in hopes that they would reflect his image to the whole world and then would therefore spread the faith. We have a lot to learn from Paul. All right, well, let's close with prayer. Oh, Father, we are grateful that like everything else in the realm of God's grace, we operate from what Jesus has already done, from whatever, what he has already accomplished. We know, Lord Jesus, that you do not seek perfection, but instead you seek our love and our faith. Would you increase even more our assurance, our trust and confidence in you? And would our outward lives match our inner belief? We pray this in the strength of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next week. Have a good week.